in life, just like today, we expect one thing, and sometimes we find we get something completely different. If you've ever traveled to the Grand Canyon at the North Rim, surrounded by nothing but vastness, overlooking a vista of layers of geology and history, there's a sign. What value do you place on silence? For me, that silence, the animals, the shooting stars, allowed me to feel alive and to connect with something more. I went for a road trip. I expected beautiful views. What I got was aliveness and transformation. It's strange that we have to go to places that evoke awe within us, away from the noise of everyday life, to feel that way. We come back feeling refreshed, ready to take on the world again because, moved by a powerful experience, we move closer to who we are and who we want to be. On a road trip, we learn to expect the unexpected. But I'm not a professional road tripper. I'm a drama teacher. My sign really should read, what value do you place on drama? The value of drama is not what you expect. Walk into any drama class and you might expect to see some of the following. Scripts, students acting, techniques, games, movement, tongue twisters. And maybe if you've taken a drama class or you've heard of one, you're not surprised about the image of 30 clowns jumping wildly or 30 students around the room in masks looking abstract, or maybe even something that resembles a spiritual seance. It might be a ritual unit after all. But what you may be surprised to hear is that even in a drama class, the last thing any student admits to actually want to do is to get up on stage. And if getting up on stage is anything like public speaking, then Mark Twain was right when he said that there are two types of public speakers, those that get scared and those that are lying. <laughs> it's a terrifying space where a performer stands up in front of the audience and what if everything falls apart? As a drama teacher, it's my job to get students taking creative risks in different dramatic genres using different dramatic elements. It's my job to teach the skills of drama. But the skills of drama are hard to explain to anyone who hasn't given it a serious go. Because I could tell you about improv, and I could tell you about Shakespeare, and I could tell you about clown and mask and the history of theater and building ensemble, and the list goes on and on with an infinity of items where once I finished, if I finished, you might say to me, okay, Paul, if that's the case, then what isn't drama? And that's my point. <laughs> is that drama is moments of life condensed. Moments of life broken down into ingredients so that they can be explored, reimagined, and restaged, and that creative process becomes a process of transformation right before our eyes. Lights down. This is a scene change. The action hasn't started yet, but I've led you down the path just a little, enough to intrigue your curiosity. In a second, I'll invite you into my drama class, where I'll ask you to suspend your disbelief for just a moment. Lights up. 
On the first day of drama class, I tell students that they are already poets, already playwrights, already creators. They don't believe me. <laughs> For the next two weeks, it is an uphill battle. Let's call it a hike. <laughs> to trust that the words they say are already poetry. And that poetry combined with the ingredients of a dramatic statue and music all together compose a group poetry performance. It's a journey they've never been on before. It's scary. But in the process, they build ensemble. And by the next week, when I tell them that the assignment is to come up with an eight-line slam poem that they're going to bring up to the stage on a mic, lit up by stage lights, the openness of that ensemble closes right back up. And so the assignment is to write a praise poem about something in the world that deserves praise but doesn't always get it. And the point is not the poem, but the creative risk being taken, whether that's the poem or the performance or just getting up on stage. Because yes, this is a drama class, but there are people in the room who don't speak in front of the group. And on performance day, in the silence between poems, between my question, who would like to go next? <laughs> and the next student volunteering, a student who I had not yet heard speak took a giant creative leap by walking on stage with a poem they wrote about their pet and sharing it in front of the class on a mic, lit up by stage lights. Lights down. I pause here to change the scene. A theater show is never what it seems, and I transport you into another world, the world of a festival. Lights up. I'm walking into an outdoor festival with 150 clown noses in a giant bag. I'm teaching a clown workshop first thing in the morning. There's a yoga class at the same time of mine. Most people head to yoga. Out of the 150 clown noses I thought were going to join me, there are 20 students who choose to play as clowns. For an hour, we play with physicality and getting big and the relationship between performer and audience using the world's smallest mask, the clown nose, we reveal the truth of what the famous playwright Oscar Wilde once asserted. Ask somebody to tell the truth, and they will lie to you. Give them a mask, and they will reveal who they are. The clown noses ended up on the dance floor with students coming up to me telling me it was the most impactful moment of their day. I wondered, amidst yoga and meditation workshops, why clown might have stood out. To me, this is my life. And a voice offered a suggestion, Paul, everybody's meditating, everybody's doing yoga, nobody's doing clown. And I've since taught clown to a handful of groups, and I get it now. The world's smallest mask, the clown nose, allows us to expand into a different physicality, to enter a world of play where we are tricked into showing up securely, fully, as ourselves. And I argue we crave that. 
we sometimes just don't know how to get there. Lights down. Intermission. I call up a friend. Hey, how are you, I ask, or not so well, how about you? Well, as usual, I've been thinking about drama. Oh, I loved my drama class, she says. I played this character where for the first time I got to express what I really wanted to express. And I hear her get animated over the phone, and even though I can only hear her, I can imagine her lighting up on the other end of the line. Well, it sounds like you're doing pretty well, I say. That's probably because I'm talking about my drama class. I'm not surprised. I've heard this same memory over and over again. My other friend fondly reminisces about our high school play every time we get together. For me, my own high school drama experiences are memories I return to when I am in the most need of a push. Lights fade up slowly. One day I ask my students to lay down on the ground. We are doing a technique from Michael Chekhov, an acting teacher, called The Four Qualities. And they lay down on the ground, and they are radiating and breathing and imagining. And from there, they get up, still radiating, and they start moving as if through mud, slowly, heavily. And this is called molding. And from there, things start getting light and buoyant, as if through water, and this is called floating. And from there, even lighter, as if through air, and they're an eagle flying over the lower mainland, and it's fun, and it's intense, and it's fast, they're soaring. And this exercise is powerful, if taken seriously. And there are people in the room thinking, this teacher's lost it. <laughs> Can you relate? In fact, for the whole unit, there are students in the room, checked out, and unwilling to do anything we're doing. And I think I've lost them, that I've failed as a teacher. I go home dejected. But later that week, I get an email from a student that has not engaged, and my assumption is I am not their best teacher. It's their reflection. They haven't yet submitted. It reads, when we were radiating and just taking a second away from life, laying on the ground, just listening to music, that short amount of time made a huge effect on me. That little thing made me want to change my life and do something with it. Lights shine bright. Theatricality helps transform. The drama classroom is a process of becoming, a process of transformation, right before our eyes. From the darkness of a blackout the stage illuminates living, breathing, shooting stars in the making, brilliantly shining across the stage like a night sky. And if you ask me, Paul, where do we train that? We train that in the drama class. Maybe you haven't considered taking a drama class before because you don't want to be an actor, right? That's totally fair. But when I said that the skills of drama are hard to explain, it's that most people expect acting. 
and maybe chaos, scripts and masks on walls and chairs and props misplaced and sometimes emotions misplaced too. But from that chaos, an order emerges, like in any other class or in any other place. Here, we're using our imagination fully, thinking, voice, movement, inside a constantly moving space. And the skills of drama help us find our balance so that, yes, we are better actors and better communicators and better speakers and better presenters and better movers. But we also discover who we are in the process. My good theater friend used to always repeat the following quote from Nietzsche. If you gaze into the abyss, the abyss gazes also into you. And whether it's the Grand Canyon or the stage, as the light goes fully dark, at the end of the day, we move into the next scene just a little different. When we go to places that evoke awe within us, we transform. Moved by a powerful experience, we move closer to who we are and to who we want to be. But we don't have to travel to the Grand Canyon to get there. Sometimes that place it's just down the hall, fulfilling an unexpected promise in a drama classroom if we just are brave enough to take the first step and sign up. Thank you. <laughs>